Recently I've been doing some experimentation with transistor amplifiers. So what you see here is just a uh, little circuit uh, 2N2222. 22, 22. Uh, it has a gain of about 110. Seems to work pretty well. I can, uh, I can pump in a 1 MHz signal and get a gain of roughly 110 out. So I decided I wanted to keep that circuit. So I made this, which is basically a surface mount version of the bigger circuit here, and just to give an idea, idea of scale, there's a penny sitting next to it, so it's a fairly small circuit, and of course it's a lot more space efficient as well compared to the uh, discrete component version. Uh, it's basically 2N, again, it's the same design, 2N2222 using 0603 components. I have done other SMD boards in the past, but it's just been uh, digital stuff. This is my uh, first jump into playing around with some uh, analog devices. So I'm going to build a couple of more of these and see how far I can take the gain up and maybe even go so far as trying to build a uh, simple little AM radio receiver or something Decided like that. I would spend a little bit more time and go ahead and document my circuit board building process. Of course, there's Tons of other ones out there. This will just be my own particular spin on it. I've done different uh, types of circuit boards over the years, uh, or used different circuit board techniques. The one that I'm going to use here uh, uses press and peel blue, which uh, I've used for many years and done all the way down to uh, 0.4 millimeter spacing, though that small a size is quite challenging. This board, of course, uses uh, SOT23 and 0603 components, so it's a lot easier to do. One of the uh, things that I do to conserve on my press and peel, because it comes in solid 8.5 by 11 sheets, is I'll cut it down to a smaller size, and then this is just a laser printer safe label, and I'll tape it over. Another thing that I do to make sure that I get proper alignment inside is I will print an initial image on the paper so that I'll know approximately where to lay my press and peel blue at and then uh, tape this on and run it through the laser printer to get the image on the press and peel blue and since I'm doing two of these boards today because I want to uh, kick the gain up on my uh, little test amplifier I will be making two of these and I'll document the steps it'll be a set of short video clips so Things will be rather disjointed as the video progresses, but this can give uh, maybe some people another way of idea of, of how circuit boards are made. It's, it's in particular uh, circuits utilizing Getting SMB ready components. to cut my circuit board for making the little amplifiers. My preferred way to do this is to use a wet tile saw. The biggest advantage of using a wet tile saw is that you get no dust generated. As the blade turns this blade will get a, a thin coating of water on it and that'll keep the the uh, dust from flying around. In fact most of the dust winds up getting down into that little tray there. Maybe get a little bit on here but it's definitely do not get the kind of dust problems that you see if you were trying to cut it with a Dremel saw or something like that. Plus since the tile saw blades are used are meant for cutting very hard materials like stone or tile the blade has had absolutely you know, no problems cutting through the circuit board. I don't have a way to run the camera while I'm actually doing the cut, so I'll, that part will happen off camera. There are the two circuit board blanks for making my little amplifier boards. And you can see how a little water gets splashed around when I'm cutting. I'll have this up, so I'll try and stand off to the side a little bit to not get sprayed by too much water, but I would much rather get a little bit of water sprayed on me by a spinning blade rather than uh, getting a, a lung full of printed circuit board This is dust. the schematic of the circuit that I have built on the breadboard, both in discrete component version as well as the SMD version. It's a fairly simple amplifier, and actually it's the first amplifier that I've managed to build that works according to my calculations. Like I said, it's nothing particularly sophisticated, but in case people are curious as to what the amplifier looks like, this is it. And then over here on my other monitor is the board layout, and actually is what I print out onto the press and peel for 
uh, applying to the circuit for one edging. step I have to perform whenever I'm building a circuit board is I need to drill a small hole in the quarter of my board because I have to support the board with a little piece of uh, fishing line to support the board inside the acid edge and the drill itself is actually a fairly fancy drill I mean it's a high uh, a uh, very low run out drill the reason that I needed to invest in that is when I'm doing my uh, digital circuit board sometimes I've got to do multi-layer boards or two-layer boards and I have to run vias and a lot of the vias I want to have pretty small so I bought these smaller bits from Drill Bit City which some of them are as are like 85 gauge bits basically they're uh, circuit bits or printed circuit board drill bits that have been resharpened and actually the ones that I bought are from Drill Bit City I've had these for several years and they work quite well the big thing is is that especially for the smaller diameters these bits break very easily and I tried using them once upon a time inside a Dremel tool and the uh, Dremel just has too much run out those little bitty bits will just snap in a heartbeat so I went ahead and invested in the uh, in the low run out drill bit for or drill press for being able to uh, do those small vias. Okay, the next step in this process is to actually transfer the toner onto the printed circuit board. My basic technique is to use an iron to preheat the board and then I'll run it through a laminator to make sure that the toner actually presses onto the board. For the laminator, of course, this little uh, board is not going to go all the way through the laminator, laminator so I have to make a uh, carrier for it, which is basically just a sheet of paper. And I'll put the press and peel with the circuit board on there and then just fold this over and that gives me a way to run it through the laminator it also helps to stabilize the uh, keep the press and peel from sliding around as well it also helps to put this more towards the back so that as it's going through the laminator the rollers don't uh, have less of a tendency to push it around as much also the reason for using the iron for uh, preheating is that it gets the toner semi tacked on to the printed circuit board and that also minimizes the chances of the uh, press and peel slipping off the board as it goes through the rollers. Of okay, the getting ready to run the board through the laminator. You can actually see the board right there if you look closely. I don't know if it'll show up on the camera or not. coming out the other side and I'll do this about six times to make sure that the toner is stuck onto the copper. Just slowly pull that out and just repeat the process and I won't bother recording any more of this. I'm not sure if it showed up on the video or not but just one of those little oversights if the uh, button hadn't shown up there. I actually still had this uh, had this laminator set on cold so those uh, previous passes you saw were basically cold passes. So I'll have to wait about five or ten minutes for this laminator to heat up and then I'll do the uh, do Okay, the this pass. is one of my boards uh, just after having been run through the laminator with the heat actually turned on this time and you can see the little outline from the circuit board as it's gone through the rollers. I have worn out one of these GBC laminators, basically stripping out the gears because I'm passing through 16th of an inch board, but uh, they're relatively cheap, so I just went and bought another one, and I think they've gotten even cheaper since I had to buy a replacement several years back. Again, I can't, uh, can't show the actual unveiling because I have no way to set up the camera, but I will restart the video after I get the press and peel pulled off, and we'll yeah, see if it actually One more started. quick shot of the... Uh, board pulled out of the carrier and you can see the see the toner showing through the press and peel. Okay, here are the results of my uh, press and peel 
had one board, the lower one, come out perfect. Everything uh, transferred. It is a little cockeyed, but that's fine. I can uh, trim it up a little bit more in the saw. The other one, it came out square, but actually, if you look closely, you can see right there, there's a little section that just didn't stick. In fact, you can still see it stuck on the press and peel right there. That is a common problem with press and peel. I mean, sometimes uh, it just doesn't stick right. But fortunately, I mean, it's a small enough of an area that I'll go back with a magic marker and touch it up. Plus, actually, there's a few other little areas on the uh, on the board where traces were a little bit thinner than I would have liked to have seen. So I'll touch those up as well as with the Okay, this is just sort of a view through the eyepiece of my microscope. That's why the image is sort of jumping around. I'm just holding the camera right over the eyepiece. And you can see the uh, area that I did a little touch up on there uh, with the uh, piece of the missing trace. Plus, also, there was a hole in that uh, one pad just a little up and left from the uh, broken trace that uh, the hole was there from the schematic I just uh, felt that it needed a little bit more copper there and the techniques fairly simple just take a fine tip magic marker and then just you don't try and actually draw you just sort of dab the tip along the path and just build it up and I'll usually uh, make one pass, let it dry for a minute or so, and then make a, a second pass just to try and get a uh, get a good layer of uh, magic marker. Yeah, this is my setup for etch and printed circuit boards. Uh, basically, I've just got a old uh, cat food container, and inside that I placed my con little uh, one gallon container that has the etching inside of it, and the lid is on there tight, so I can't pop that off just yet. But that gives me a convenient way to uh, uh, keep the etchant stored and also just gives me some secondary containment in case the uh, one gallon of etchant uh, container happens to break or something. It'll wind up with ferric chloride all over the place. And I'll also I'll show a complete setup after everything is uh, set up and, and I'm actually etching the boards. But I've got a little bubbler set up here, and then this actually goes into the tank right here. And this is a little heater. I usually like to try and get my etching up to at least 85 to 90 degrees, just so things etch a lot faster. So I'll continue recording after I get everything set up here. And you can okay, I've got the etchant uh, set up, and it's uh, slowly heating up. You can see it bubbling. You can see the uh, little aquarium heater that's in there. It usually takes about 15 to 20 minutes for the etchant to get up to temperature. I'll periodically check it. There's supposed to be a little thermostat on the top of there, or at least an adjustment for a thermostat. And uh, that actually broke off on me yesterday, so it's stuck at max heat now, so I'll have to check it from time to time. A couple of a few other things I forgot to mention. Of course, when you're messing around with this stuff, uh, at the very least, have some safety glasses on to keep the acid out of your eyes in case uh, something splashes up, or a little bubble or whatever. And then also it's a good idea just to have some rubber gloves because the uh, ferric chloride will stain your hands. And being an acid is probably not exactly good for your okay, skin. Okay, the uh, etchant is finally up to about 80 degrees. So we'll go ahead and put the circuit boards in. Here are the boards hanging on the uh, hanging on the the little holder. Basically, just going to set that in there. It's having some problems sinking there. Okay, there it goes. Just get that centered up. Notice I'm wearing the glove. I've also got my safety glasses on. Like I said, I'm not. Uh, wear the safety glasses because I'm worried about getting acid in my eyes, but I'm wearing the gloves more because I'm concerned about uh, my hands getting stained brown if uh, I get any etching on them. So we'll let that cook for about five minutes and check it out and see how okay, far Okay, just pulled the uh, circuit boards out. They've been uh, in there for about ten minutes and they look pretty good. I think I maybe see one spot there that I may dip it back in and out a few times, but uh, uh, looks like overall they came out pretty good, so I'll 
uh, get that last little bit taken off there then I'll inspect them under the microscope make sure that there's not any other spots that may be a problem and uh, we'll okay here's another uh, microscope shot showing the etched circuit board in particular I wanted to highlight that area where uh, I had to do my little bit of touch up and fill in but the uh, overall board looks like it came out great I mean, even the little thin outline there that really isn't part of the circuit board, but just sort of got uh, uh, got included from the drawing, uh, even it came out quite nicely. I mean, you can really get quite nice resolutions with press and peel. Like I said, I've done down to as, as small as 0.4 millimeter spacings, but you know, you really got to have your process under control when you're trying to trying to go that small. So we'll get some acetone and uh, get the uh, get the uh, resist off of there and uh, see what the copper looks like. Okay here's a shot again with the copper or with the uh, toner removed used acetone for that which actually it's the first time I've used acetone for uh, removing the toner usually I've scrubbed it off but uh, yeah using the acetone works very nicely but there's the same spot that I had to uh, touch up earlier and of course the copper's there you know the the uh, this permanent marker pen works just fine. So overall, I'm very sat, very happy with the uh, results I'm seeing here. So the step after this will be I need to start uh, staging up my SMD components, which I will document that as well, and we'll start getting busy getting this board stuffed. The next step in all this uh, building a surface mount circuit board is getting the surface mount components staged up. Since these parts are so tiny, you know, you can't, uh, it's very hard to just, uh, you know, grab one and just uh, stick it in there like you might do with a through hole component. These are the uh, components that I ordered from Mauser to build this, uh, build this circuit board. What I like to do to organize my parts is I will stage them up in basically a little, uh, I guess this is a 30-day pill holder. And each part, I don't know if you can even see that, but each part uh, gets placed into, uh, into one of these bins. And then as I go along, I will uh, pull the parts from there and then actually place it on the circuit board. And of course, to keep things organized, I uh, make up a little spreadsheet that uh, tells me what the part number is, part number is, and the bin number that I've got the part stored in, and so on. So the next step will be to get the solder paste and get the paste on the board, and then start mounting the components up. In front of a microscope now, I'm getting ready to start applying solder paste onto my two circuit boards, which you can see them right there. And then this is a syringe that I use for applying solder paste. I have a larger, I think it's a 30 or 40 uh, gram tube of solder paste that I've actually had for several years and uh, it continues to work just fine. Uh, the syringe is a blunt temp syringe. Uh, I have actually used insulin needles before uh, for applying solder paste. Uh, I had a cat that had insulin that I had, or had diabetes that I had to give shots to. And insulin needles work sort of okay. They're a little thin and tend to plug up. And uh, also actually having that sharp point on there actually gets in the way when you're trying to carefully place paste. So unfortunately there's no way for me to show the actual applying of the paste. But I'll start up the video again after I get the paste applied onto the board so you can see Our about paste has been like. applied now. There's probably no way for this camera to even show it directly. Uh, if you can't see anything at all, they probably just look like little gray dots. But if you take a peek inside with the microscope, then you can see see where the solder paste has been applied. Again, this is uh, setting up, the, pointing the camera down straight down the lens of the microscope, so it doesn't provide the best image in the world but that is the solder paste to Okay, so the next step is to actually start placing the parts. Now, obviously the parts you're never going to pick up with your bare fingers and some people I guess have used tweezers. I've, I've tried to use tweezers as well but they just it doesn't seem to work quite as well. 
So what I use is a basically a set of vacuum tweezers. And all it is is just a just a little vacuum pump and then I've got a head head unit right here and this is uh, what I actually use to uh, to pick up the parts out of the tray. And of course the tray, the parts have already been staged up in here as demonstrated in a earlier step and basically I will just hold the vac or create a vacuum. That's what this is uh, this little tube right here is for when I put my finger over it. Uh, it'll start drawing a vacuum through the head and then when I get the part where I want it I'll let my finger off. Uh, that seems to be the easiest way to uh, to get the parts to get uh, parts to release. So I will go ahead and proceed on with that step and in the next clip uh, you should see some mounted up parts. Okay, here's the board with the parts all placed. Fairly straightforward process. Uh, sometimes it does require a little poking and prodding to get components completely centered after you drop them off with the uh, with the vacuum pickup. But overall, I'm I'm satisfied with the results. So the next step will be to pop it into the toaster oven and uh, get these uh, get the solder melted. Okay, here are the boards uh, in the uh, set up and ready to go into the little toaster oven. Goes without saying that uh, this little toaster oven only gets used for chips and not for uh, not for toast. My basic process is I'll uh, set the set the thermostat to about 300 degrees and let it cook at that temperature for a couple of minutes, and then I'll crank it all the way up to broil and hold it at that temperature until I see the solder paste I'm not sure how visible this will be but the uh, solder paste just fused and if you can see the little shiny uh, shiny dots those are the areas where the solder paste is uh, has finally melted it took about two minutes on 300 and then about two and a half minutes just cranked up to broil so we'll slowly bring the thing back down in temperature and uh, get the connector attached on there and we'll test them and see how well Okay, it works. this is the board after it's uh, been through the uh, been through the oven and the uh, solder seems to have uh, melted just fine. I do see a few spots there, may see some little uh, solder balls. Uh, I'll go in there and I'll pick those out just to make sure that they aren't they don't uh, create any shorts or anything like that. Had a similar thing happen on the uh, on the first SMD board that I built, uh, so probably I need to just get a little finer finer tip uh, uh, on my syringe that I'm using to apply solder paste. I sort of had some problems getting just a little more on there than I preferred to see, but it looks like overall I think the uh, the board came out just fine. So I'll get these little solder balls picked out of there, and then we'll get the connector attached okay, I've got down. The connectors uh, placed on the two circuit boards, getting ready to solder them on. Uh, no major uh, issues to be expected here. I mean, it's just standard uh, standard through hole soldering. Okay, there's the uh, connector soldered on one of the boards. Came out fair. Probably could have done with a little bit more solder and a few points, but. Uh, probably uh, run with it as is. And this one, again, not great. Probably could do a little bit more solder. I see one spot where uh, where there's a little bit of a gap there, but uh, should be good enough. I mean, this is just for uh, prototyping a little bit, so we'll next step will be to actually plug it in and see if it okay, actually Okay, I got works. my uh, 1 megahertz signal going in. This is actually just going into my original board. I want to verify that everything's still working there. Got roughly uh, 20 millivolts coming in. And then checking the output. Of course it goes off the scale, so I'm going to set the camera down for a second. And increase the voltage to an appropriate level. And we're currently set on 0.5 volts per division, so we went from Roughly 20 millivolts in peak to peak to approximately 2 volts out peak to peak. So uh, basically getting about a gain of 100 on this uh, on the original board that I did. So now we'll pop in the other two and see if we get some. Okay, here's results. the first board and the output. Still the same 20 millivolt uh, peak to peak coming in. 
and it looks like we're getting about 1.8 volts out on this one so maybe a little weaker gain but uh, still seems to be working just fine so time to try okay, this is the second board looks like getting the same result basically getting about 1.8 volts out for uh, 20 millivolts in so it's performing uh, pretty much identically to the other board like I'll go back and check my number one board and uh, I don't know I said roughly two volts I didn't look at it real close uh, go back and check it again and see if it really was two volts or if it's actually about one point. Okay, put the first board back in and uh, it's actually showing about the same as well. So it looks like all of them have the uh, have the same amount of gain to them. So that uh, pretty much does it for as far as uh, assembling a surface mount circuit boards. I've still got more experimenting to do. I want to stack these together and see how well the gain works and uh, do some more experimenting and maybe as I uh, continue along I may do some other do some other little videos so that's all for now